Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. It is the famed Monday schmooze brought to you by Gatorade. Great to have you with us. Dave Revson, and Nicole Auerbach, Howard Griffith. We had an interesting Saturday. We had some shifting, some movement in the West. Have a, a front runner there. We had some dominance. We had, I think, at least one perceived upset. So yeah. some intrigue. Oh, absolutely. I think the West, this is kind of, we don't usually get this much clarity this early in the season, right? I think now you have a clear front runner and a path to get to Indianapolis. Starting to see some things happen uh, in the West, as you mentioned, some teams that are playing better. We also saw a team in the East that we thought would be able to bounce back from a, a huge loss two weeks ago, not really step up to the level that they need to be playing. Yeah, obviously getting at Maryland, and we will talk about them and that loss to Illinois. Let's dive into our big story. It is the weekend that was. And again, the top teams in the league look the part. Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, all winning by at least 34 points. Iowa, of course, we're referring to now with the leg up in the West. They turned in another outstanding defensive performance, topping Wisconsin and Madison. Great comeback for Rutgers and then that Illinois win. We were talking about conference win number one for them. I think we have to start with the game that had the most influence on who gets to Indy. And that, of course, is Iowa topping Wisconsin 15 to 6. It was a typical Iowa game. They had more punts than first downs. And yet got the one big play in the game, LeSean Williams, with the touchdown run. Defense played fabulously. Great field position football. And now they have a leg up. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like we say this every week of like how they're comfortable winning games. But considering all the injuries on the offense as well as the overall struggles, I think this is the formula, right? right. And, and that one big play, we've seen this in a couple of different games, is enough. Because yes. their defense and their special teams are so good. And you know how I feel about Tory Taylor. Love him. He is a weapon. <laughs> he is a weapon, right? Yeah. He was no, controlling no doubt this about game. It. He may have been the most important player in the game. He, like, we, right. we vacillated a I little know. bit on Field this. Field position is important, and especially, and especially what he was able to do every time he was kicking the ball, right? And so, obviously, you want to see more offensively. You want to sustain drives. You know, pick up more first downs, right. certainly. Yeah. But... One play defense special teams, that is all it takes for Iowa to win. And it's remarkable because I just don't think other people can win this way. I, you're, you're right because, you know, I continue to think about how do they do this week in, year in, year out. Yeah. I mean, seriously, yeah. this has just been their formula and they're comfortable with who they are. And, and I think so many times we talk about having to win at least two or three, right? Offense special teams or defense, this team consistently wins defense and special teams each and every week. So that really holds true to being able to win. It's, it's never pretty, but what we saw two weeks ago was them run the football and have success doing it. Again, they went back and were able to lean on that run game to really be able to deliver a victory for them. I will say this. When we were at camp, we thought the offensive line was going to be better. And it wasn't better at the outset of the year. It's been better it's here been these last two weeks, right? I mean, if you can run the ball like they have the last couple of weeks, right, averaging about 190 rushing yards yeah. per game, I realize they're very limited <laughs> quarterback right now, very limited in the past game, and especially the injury to Eric All is mm -hmm. going to be devastating. So now you've lost Luke Lachey and Eric All. You're down a, a running back still, yeah. and yet figuring out a way – that you've had a different back go off over the last two weeks, and this run game looks like maybe it's going to be the answer for them offensively. And when you look at the West, the way the other teams are playing, it's not like they're putting 40 and 50 points up each and every week. Right. So if you've got a good defense that's going to be able to limit people, offensively you just don't need to turn the football over. And again, when you have a great punter who can flip the field the way they can, you know, it becomes difficult for other offenses to be able to go the long to you know, be able to put a long drive together. I think it's a great point about who you have to beat to get to Indianapolis and what we've seen. We've seen a lot of inconsistent quarterback play yeah. in a lot of the teams yeah. in the West. We've seen some good defenses, certainly. But if you have the best defense and you're not turning the ball over and you're just taking care of the ball and you win a game 15-6, it's beautiful to you. <laughs> That's that. It is beautiful to Kirk Ferentz because they won the game. Now they control their destiny, right, Absolutely. in the West. And, yes. again, I, I just think this is replicable. We've seen it. it. Again, a lot of other teams don't win games with this few total offensive no. yards, but they can. So I think they're going to keep doing it. They don't have any other option because you just don't have the bodies. Six win with 250 or fewer yards since the beginning of last year, to your point. Uh, no one else in the country is more than two. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> They've tripled anyone else. 
We were talking about inconsistent quarterback play and Wisconsin now there are reports Pete Thamel reporting this morning that Tanner Mordecai broke his hand and had a pin inserted yesterday. So that's a huge blow for Wisconsin. We saw uh, Locke come in and was okay, but but certainly not at the level of Mordecai. Uh, Wisconsin, when they've been good, they've been able to run the ball. They weren't really able to run the ball in this mm-hmm. game. They weren't able to run it against Washington State. And now they got to dig themselves out of a little bit of a hole, and, and it seems without their star running back, or their star quarterback. Yeah, absolutely. And we've we've talked a lot about them in different ways, different performances, right? There have been times where they have passed the ball mm-hmm. well. And then there has been the run game, which has been the more reliable side of it. And then you have Ches Malusi's injury. So you have all those different factors, questions about the defense against the pass sometimes. But now you've just got to survive this. You, you've got to figure out a way to win some football games and move the ball. Again, not every defense is going to be Iowa's defense. That's true. But that was, I think, a very disappointing offensive performance, you know, even outside of the injury, that they really weren't able to to get points on the board, to have the types of drives. Field position was a factor. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's not what you want when we talk so much about an offensive (laughs) overhaul all offseason and the early part of this year. Well, I guess part of it, too, and we've also talked about this, is that, you know, this isn't ultimately the offense that they, quote, unquote, want to display yeah. or right. yeah. have a reputation for having when you look at Phil Longo in his past. So he's a, he's adapted the system to what it is that they, they can do right now. And right now it's about being able to go out and run the football. And that's where they have to lie. Unfortunately for them last week, they were playing against a, a really good defense that can slow you down in the run game, if not take it all away from you. So now as they continue to move forward to get back into the race, it, it's about really honing in and really – I guess it, it's finding out and making sure the things that you can do and be successful doing running the football, that's where you have to lean. And you're going to have to get something out of the pass game. And they're not Iowa. They're not going to be able to survive without putting points up with the pass game. Right. The defense is not at the level no. of Iowa. So it's good. Yeah. It, it, it seems like it's gotten a little bit better as the year's gone on. And it's not great. It's not the level it's been in past Oh, yeah. Years. But I think they'll keep they'll getting get, better. Yeah, they'll as, get there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But this is a – but you're in transition, right? You're Absolutely. installing a new offense. You got a new defensive scheme. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it and and now you got to go to Illinois, and then you got Ohio State looming the next week. Yeah, but again, you you need to rebound against Illinois. This is right. an opportunity, even though they're coming off a nice win, yeah. that you need to establish those things. As mm-hmm. you said, you have to have a pass game to help the run game. Right. Let's dive into the the teams at the top of the East. At least a couple of them. Michigan. It was a little bit of a shaky start. Howard, Indiana, reached into the bag of tricks. Yeah. Donovan McCauley throwing the touchdown pass, yeah. former quarterback. They went up 7 nothing, and then Michigan scored 52 straight points. And I think one of the things that happens, particularly early in the game, you know the plays and the coaches and the players know the plays that are going to be coming out in that first series, whether it's the first 10 or first 15. So everybody's very comfortable with that. And, and a lot of time, the way coaches structure those is to get a lot of different looks that you hope to be able to rely upon later in the game. But it just shows you – when you talk about this Michigan team from a defensive standpoint, that yeah, you may be able to get them here and there, but then once they get the book on you, once things settle down and you become who you are, they're going to be, become suffocating and take things away. And that's what you saw happen. But to see them be creative, Indiana, early in the game, was good because obviously they're coming off a of bye, making a change at the coordinator position, going with Coach Carey. You wanted to see that, and I think there was some positive there, but this Michigan team is just really, really good. Uh, agree completely on, you know, just the, the positivity and the excitement that you saw out of Indiana right out of the gate, but then also Michigan responding to that yeah. in, in a first quarter where they were outplayed, outgained, the offense really couldn't get anything going, and then to put on the show and play Michigan football the way that they want to, it's really impressive because even despite that first quarter, it's still such a complete win because of the way that they played those other three quarters. Mm -hmm. J.J. McCarthy, extremely accurate, getting different players involved. They're running the ball when they want to. Might not be the (laughs) longest runs, but they are getting it when they need to, getting it in the end zone. And it's just so hard to watch a game with this Wolverine team and come out and not be impressed by the way they win it. Just the way they do it. I mean, they're they're playing – they're playing the game differently than, than I think a lot of people around the country who are spreading it out, throwing it all over. They can do that if they need to. Yes. But they want to run the ball, right, and set up the pass and take exactly what people are giving them. They're not necessarily trying to, to put the defense in conflict. They're just executing their game plan 
and running through people. One, and one of the things, you and I were talking about this before the show, about the way they're using the running backs. It's yeah. very limited, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about how Jim Harbaugh spoke about this a couple weeks ago. He was saying he didn't, he was worried about injuries, also worried about earning potential when they go to the NFL. But you can see that because yeah. Blake Corum's numbers don't jump out on the stat sheet. Mm -hmm. Right? He's nope. not always going for over 100 yards, but he's getting a lot of touchdowns because they uh, need him yes. at the end zone and they get him in the end zone. And then Donovan Edwards gets in the end zone this time. But it's definitely different. We're yeah. seeing a shift, I think, in the philosophy of the way that he is using the running back position. And I think that really goes to how comfortable he is right now. Coach Harbaugh, where he can look at the big picture because he trusts his coaching staff, he trusts his team. So it, most people will say it is not Jim Harbaugh's job to make sure Blake Corum gets to the National Football League as healthy as possible. Some people will say that that's not his job. His job is to win national championships, Big Ten championships. But if you can do both. <laughs> right. the, it's a great, yeah. re great recruiting yeah. pitch, yeah. Absolutely. Way. And I think that's, to me, the genius in it, right? Because he understands, listen, I still, I want these guys to be successful. You walk in their homes and tell them, I'm going to put you in the best position to be a better person, to earn money if you can make it to the National Football League. And this is just part of it. And part of it is because what we've seen in the National Football League as far as running backs are concerned and their earning potential. Well, you've got the national leader in touchdown runs and the national leader in touchdown catches. So that's a pretty good combination. Yeah. It's, it's a balance. Yeah. Right? That's what we call a balanced <laughs> offense. Yes, not bad. Uh, they, of course, go to Michigan State coming up yeah. this weekend. That is a primetime game. Ohio State. We've questioned Ohio State at, at times this year. It mm -hmm. hasn't always looked like Pretty. a complete game. No, it, yeah. it hasn't. And then you come into this game, and it's like, man, I mean, they're down Travion Henderson. They're down Emeka Abuka. You get a, a, another running back injury to chip train him during the course of the game. Mm -hmm. Dallin Hayden comes in. He was great. I think this was their most impressive and complete effort of the year, and it feels to me like, this is the best spot they could be in as they head into the game against Penn State. Couldn't agree more. I was incredibly impressed with what you just said. I mean, the injury is being down to your fourth string running back, and he was good, and he was reliable, and they were able to get the ball to Marvin Harrison. All the things that they want to do offensively, they were still able to do despite all of that. I thought it was really impressive. Again, and then pulling away in some of these games, right? So the defense has been really impressive so far this season. It's been a strength. It's going to be tested in a very different way against Penn State and the talent on that offense. But to date, it has done its job. It is limited big plays. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a complete effort of just – controlling the game. The game was never in doubt, even with the injuries at key positions. Yeah, for me, one of the first things that jumped out, and I thought this would happen earlier in the season, but moving Marvin Harrison around pre-snap, putting him in motion, putting him in different spots on the field. And I'm not saying that that didn't happen earlier in the year, but it was it was noticeable change this, in this game. And I think that also gives uh, Penn State more to be concerned about where is he going to be on the field, which is important. But you're starting to see the team, you know, offensively, they're, they're finding him. And, and he's a weapon, right? We all know that. And you have to find ways to get the ball. It also shows the depth and the recruiting that they've been able to do at the running back position and Coach Alfred getting those guys ready to go and prepared to step up if needed be. And how about Cade Stover, too? I mean, he was really important to what they wanted to do offensively. I think we think he's maybe underrated nationally, yeah. the tight end position. But I would love to see him continue to stay really involved and find the end zone a lot for them. I continue to say, had he stayed healthy, they would have won that George game last year. I mean, to me, that is that where was a that factor. game turned. He's really, really good. The defense has been so solid here. Mm -hmm. They don't give up big plays. As we know, Penn State doesn't really produce many big plays, so we'll, we'll talk about that game a little bit later. Devin Mockaby did have a nice game for Purdue, but, man, they did a job on Hudson Card. Yeah. He just had no time to throw, battled accuracy issues, but so much of it was he had guys in his face all day. Out. And I think that's part of it, right? When you have a quarterback that you know can hurt you, right, with his arm and can get out with his legs and extend plays, keeping them under duress is the recipe for success. And, and we talk about this Ohio State defense and the things that they've been able to do and not do, not give up those big plays, but causing, getting into the backfield, causing quarterbacks a second uh, to, to think, get down to their second and third uh, options on the field 
it is really important, something they're going to have to be able to do this week. And it helps the back end of the defense, right? It's all interconnected. Absolutely. So yeah. that was, again, really encouraging. This is a great performance to mm -hmm. have going into such a big game. It's a nice combination to have. They have a really good defensive line and a really good secondary. And, and that's where they stand. There are yeah. some elite defenses in this league. We've talked about Iowa and mm -hmm. certainly the three teams at the top of the East. Are really, <laughs> really good. good. Yeah. Defensively. Latest AP poll came out yesterday. The top four staying the same, which means Michigan is second, Ohio State third. Penn State actually moved down a spot, but that's really more a function of future Big Ten member Washington moving up after topping Oregon. The Ducks are ninth. Iowa in the poll at number <laughs> 24. USC and UCLA both ranked despite losses over the weekend. Uh, Penn State getting warmed up for this weekend as they completely dismantled UMass, uh, two punt return touchdowns for Daquan Hardy, yeah. which is pretty exceptional. This was a well-rounded performance against what isn't a great team. Yeah, absolutely. It was what, the type of performance you want, right? We've been looking at this as kind of a warm-up. You want to kind of just get going because you're going to be going up against Ohio yes. State. And <laughs> Level of difficulty. A little bit different. Increases a little bit different. A little, yeah. um, but I just, like, I just remain so impressed by this defense. I know like basically the theme of our show today is these defenses. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're so good at getting negative plays. Yeah. Seven sacks, 14 tackles for loss. They're just so aggressive. And that's what's going to make this showdown this weekend really interesting against another first-year starting quarterback yeah. in Kyle McCord, Andrew Aller. They still aren't explosive offensively. Mm -hmm. and they're not really trying to be. Do you, do you think that they're, they're very comfortable with the way that they are winning these games? I, I do. I think that, that ultimately everyone wants, wants to see the big plays, including yeah. them. They yeah. want to see them. But ultimately, they turn around, look at the scoreboard, look at the numbers and they're doing all the things that they need to be and when you talk about defense I mean it, they just keep getting better yeah. and it's really about you know creating havoc for that opposing quarterback and, and they keep delivering and they just have so many packages and, and I would even go venture to say Ohio State's going to see some things this weekend that they haven't seen that they haven't shown all year oh yeah they're, they're going to be they're going to be some matchups on the defensive line that they haven't seen that they haven't necessarily been prepared for and you know, I know it's early in the week, but I think Abdul Carter is going to have a major impact rushing the passer in this game because he is – that's one of the things he's really been working on this offseason. You haven't seen it necessarily as much, but I would not be surprised if he lined up at a defensive end position or over the nose hmm. and came and started wow. to blitz from there. I think they are going to move this group around and, and really try to give them so many different looks. Huh. Over the be. nose with Abdul Khan. I think you can put him anywhere you want to. Is this a yeah. Monday bold prediction? Yeah. Oh, How about wow. That? Okay. Wow. Might, yeah. You may need to go with that. I might need to, right? I mean, that's about what you're done. That's one piece of work. Wow, we're Check getting, it off the Friday checklist. Wow, we're getting a lot done today. Yeah, we really are. Uh, they are number one in the nation in total defense. It's not even close. They lead the nation in sacks per game as well. I agree with you on the big play, certainly through the passing game. Yeah. Like Drew Aller hasn't thrown an interception yet. So you have a young quarterback, to your point, and you have him make safe throws that allow you to move the ball down the field. I do find it curious that Singleton and Allen haven't broken big runs. That's the part of it that's weird on the lack of explosive plays to me. I, I think you can understand the, the passing part of it. But the running part of it is a little strange just because Singleton was among the national leaders yeah. in, in runs of 40 yards or longer last year. Yeah, I, we were talking about this. You just The numbers for Big Ten skill players are not gaudy at all. We no. look at what's going on nationally. Yeah. And, and we're not seeing it for whatever reason. And we talk about an offensive line. This is an offensive line that we thought this was probably the best offensive line that Coach Franklin has had since he's been there. And they protect the quarterback. But we just haven't seen those runs, and they're going to need – that's going to be a big part of this game, uh, and they're going to have to find ways to, to, to run the football. I, I, that has been the confusing part to me as well uh, about not breaking off those big runs because we know they have the speed and the talent and the agility to do that. The pass game, though, I'm so interested to see as this grows throughout the season because I really thought UMass would have been an opportunity to air it out, especially yes. because – Everyone talked about chucking it last year, last week, <laughs> yeah, and like yeah. you're really airing it out. But UMass was allowing quarterbacks to have uh, almost 10 yards per attempt. And then Drowler only seven yards per attempt. Like they just didn't try it. And I thought that this would be an opportunity to, um, again, it's a first year quarterback. You are winning games. You're going to keep doing what you're doing. But at some point, you got to open the playbook a little bit, you would think. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I guess I defer to you, Howard. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you have a, a really good number one receiver in, in Keandre Lambert Smith. Mm -hmm. The tight ends are really good, and it feels like the tight ends allow you to have a dimension in the pass yeah. game that still keeps the secondary honest, right? You're right. I mean, I, those guys get the matched up, field, obviously, right. with linebackers, occasionally mm -hmm. with safeties. But, but now all of a sudden, like, so maybe that puts less pressure on you to throw downfield because it gives you a, another option of, of two really talented pass catchers. Well, why put the ball in harm's way if you don't need to? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not looking at the game through, through Drew's eyes. You know, even though we can watch film, you can still watch film and say, well, I would have taken that shot. But that doesn't mean anything to us. We're looking at it in hindsight, and we're looking at it in slow motion where he's processing this time, game real time. So I think that the fact that he is not turning the football over is you can be very comfortable with that. And because they'll be challenged. We, we know that's what's going to happen. They're, they're going to be challenged this week, and, and we're going to find out just how far this offense has come or needs to go to be considered one of the teams from the national perspective. I, I just don't think this is still a team from a national pitcher that's getting the kind of respect that I think that they probably deserve at this particular well, point. Well, if they win this week, they certainly yeah. will. <laughs> yes, they there you will. go. Yes, they will. <laughs> More on that game coming up. Uh, let's dive a little bit into Rutgers and Michigan State. This is a great story. What a game, Down 24 to 6 going into the fourth quarter. I will say they were aided and abetted, Rutgers was, by no Michigan doubt. State because <laughs> – the Spartans had two major snafus in special teams. But still, the resilience of this Rutgers team. And when you outgain a team 120 to negative 20 in the fourth quarter, you're doing something right. Both sides of the ball. It's a great win for Rutgers. Yeah, and, and Menungai was phen phenomenal Incredible. in yeah. that fourth quarter. That taught me, we, we've raved about this Rutgers team, right? We have said that they are winning games the way they want to with the defense and the run game and, and good special teams, yes. just, just solid special teams. They don't even yeah. need to be creating that much chaos there. And the fight and the heart to come back in this game I thought was really, really impressive because we do believe that they've improved. They were coming off of a really tough loss mm -hmm. against Wisconsin when we said, okay, we, I thought that they could be in that game. It slips away from them. And they respond this way in a game they were down big really impressive and now they're one game away from bowl eligibility with yeah. Indiana on deck they right. could be bowl eligible in the middle of October which is impressive hey, you saw their coach emotional after the game Very. Uh, just well, a bit yeah right yeah. he knows and I think part of it is you mentioned it the way they're winning games but it's still about building this foundation there and it's about winning because how do you get recruits I mean you, you're winning so I, I think the foundation is set. They're starting to win these games. But to, to be down that way and still you have to be able to respond. And they just, since he's taken over, the one thing that has always jumped out to me, even when they were getting blasted by some teams in, in previous years, you could never say, team's not playing hard. Yeah. Team's not playing hard. Late in the fourth quarter, they're still playing hard. So they believe what's coming from the front of the room. I always talk about that. And, and it's significant when you're watching a program build to where they ultimately are trying to get to. A win like this is, is, is important. And the fact, you know, sometimes we, we take bowl eligibility just for granted. It depends on the school, right? Like Iowa clinched bowl eligibility this week, and, and no one's making a big deal out of it because right. it's 11 straight years. But for Rutgers, it's a big deal, and to Nicole's point, to do right. it in October. And that's yeah. why... Yeah. Uh, that's why every program is different. And, and that's why I talk about it, and I'm jumping forward real quick. But as we gain these new teams into the conference, it's so important for administrations to understand what the philosophy and what the real ceiling is for your program so that the coach that you bring in or that you have there has an opportunity. Some places are going to take more than five years. But if you've got the right coach and you believe in them and you can watch that progression continue to build, that's what you have to hold your, hang your hat on, and that's what you're seeing at Rutgers. We well, had a good body of evidence that Greg Shiano could get it done there. <laughs> Excuse me, and uh, it certainly has happened. Yeah. Michigan State, man, it's tough. I mean, just shooting themselves in the foot. They have 15 turnovers now, third most in the nation. The special teams issues, a, a, a huge problem there. They got Michigan this week, so it didn't figure to get any yeah. easier for the Spartans. Uh, what about Illinois going on the road in beating Maryland, and we can talk about it from the Terps' point of view yeah. here in a bit because this was a little bit of 
exactly what Michael Oxley talks about, Terps versus Terps, so yep. some of that. But, man, Illinois, I mean, that game, like, let's just come out and say it. Like, that game last Friday against Nebraska, Illinois was dreadful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, really played about as poorly yep. as you could play in a home game against a team that you should match up pretty well against. And I think it was not unreasonable to worry that the season might totally slip away. Yeah. Let's give a ton of credit yeah. to Brett Bielema, to that team. The line of scrimmage has been a major issue for them mm -hmm. this year. They won the line of scrimmage both sides of the ball. Howard. And that's what they have to do. And I think sometimes when you're, you're having success, and maybe it's a year early than most people would have thought, and last year they were in the middle of trying to win the West and had those opportunities. So sometimes there's some carryover that, okay, you're automatically supposed to do this, and then you look at the line of scrimmage from last year and you see what you have coming back. So the expectations are very high for them to be able to do it. But talk about that Nebraska game, only running, rushing for 21, 21 yards. Yeah. You know, they, they put that behind them and were able to, to really get the run game going defensively. They were playing a lot better at the line of scrimmage, getting into the opponent's backfield, and that's what they have to do. And, you know, Coach Gennaro talked about this on Saturday's show. This game is not really about Maryland for Illinois and probably not Maryland. Maryland needs to focus on them, but Illinois needs to focus on who they are. Right. And they really, to me, really came out and showed that, okay, what we saw a week before is not who they are. Yeah, that was the, the biggest surprise, right? That this was a team that looked so different. They had been blown out. All mm -hmm. of their losses against Power 5 competition yep. were over 10 points. I mean, it was not just to stay in the game, but to fight and to claw yeah. and then to, to kick it and win that way uh, was really, really impressive. And I agree with you, Dave. I mean, you go from being like, is this going to be kind of a lost season to, okay, well, here they are going to factor into yep. the West race. Maybe they're not going to win it, but they're going to be a tough out if they can play like this. Right. I, I think that's the way I would look at it now. You have three losses. I mean, I think you're behind the eight ball mm -hmm. to a certain extent yeah. in terms of do you really have a chance to win the division? But can you have a say as to who does win the division? Maybe even starting this weekend here against Wisconsin, yeah. a team they beat handily last year, a, a team that their win over hastened the exit, mm -hmm. I think, of, of Paul mm -hmm. Christ, right? There was this feeling that, that maybe things were shifting. So, mm -hmm. yeah, give, give them a ton of credit. Maryland, on the other hand, we talked on Friday, these are the kinds of games they've been winning, like home games against unranked teams, it felt like this is – the question mark for them was, can you beat Ohio State, can you beat Michigan, can you beat Penn State? And just did not get it done here. Uh, did not run the ball well at all, mm -hmm. which you would expect them to be able to do. And just overall, kind of a listless performance. Yeah. I mean, the, the penalties ended up hurting them. There were just a number of things, the self-inflicted wounds, mm -hmm. which have been a problem with them through the years. Yeah, it was – uh, carryover, obviously. If you lose to Ohio State and now Ohio State beat you twice, yeah. it was the the kind of loss that you really can't afford. And it's just really frustrating, Howard. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about this and we we like so much of where Maryland is going and their improvements yeah. defensively. They were in that game against Ohio State for three quarters, and then you you have a dud like this, yeah. and it just wasn't there wasn't energy. You know, the crowd wasn't yeah. really there or into it either. And it just – it didn't feel right as you're watching this game. It felt like it was mm -hmm. a ripe opportunity here yeah. for Illinois. And then they obviously played well. But, like, we talked about what Maryland did at the line of scrimmage at times against Ohio State. Like, for it was just, it was just kind of a stunning performance mm -hmm. on both sides from what we've seen from these two teams in recent weeks. Again, give a lot of credit to Illinois. But Maryland cannot do this if they are trying to take that next step as yeah. a program. And, and that's – I guess when you look at it from a fan's perspective and obviously as a coaching perspective as well, it's got to be so frustrating, right? Because you, you know how good you are. You know where you are. Right. Everyone's talking about you for a reason, being able to take that next step. It, it wasn't a fluke. But also people you know, talked about the schedule. The schedule wasn't you know, necessarily indicative of how good they actually are, and we'll find out. But this is a game that, that was, to me, just – you just have to win this game. Yeah, you do. If it just comes down to you have better players. Yep. You should be able to win this game. Um, and, and not to be able to have the performance that they needed really is tough against a team that had been struggling. And, again, little things like special teams. Yeah. Isaiah Williams had two long punt returns, and then Illinois had a long kickoff return mm -hmm. in the fourth quarter. Like, that's the kind of stuff that it just can't happen. Right. And, and you, look at, happen. you look at the way – this roster is, is, is built for 
Maryland. There's a lot of talent on that team. Right. So you would expect you should always get good special teams coverage uh, when you have that, the type of athletes that they have on that team. They have a bye this week. I'd say they probably need it. And then go to Good Northwestern time. and yeah. then Penn State comes to town. Mm -hmm. So kind of the next of yep. those big games is, is a few weeks away here for the Terps. A big stat brought to you by Gatorade. A record-breaking crowd yesterday in Iowa City. 55,646 fans on hand to watch the crossover at Kinnick as the Iowa women's hoops team topped DePaul in an exhibition basketball game. Game that was shown here on the Big Ten Network. The largest crowd ever to watch a women's hoops game. Caitlin Clark went for a triple double in the Hawks 22 point win. And, and she, yeah, yeah, she calls that another day at the office. Uh, there is the number, a truly amazing scene. Game also raised money for the university's children's hospital. Did the wave just like they do at the football games. A quarter of a million dollars going to the hospital from the athletic department. Incredible event for head coach Lisa Bluter and company. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody that made this day so special for the University of Iowa, the state of Iowa, and our women's basketball program. Nowhere, nowhere in the country could this happen except for at the University of Iowa. you were a part of history today. Thank you. I want to give a special shout out to our administration, our facilities people, our ticketing people, our unbelievable band, the cheer squad, the dance team. You are all a part of this. But most importantly, every single fan. God bless you. A uh, truly amazing day. And tonight you can catch more of Caitlin Clark and the Hawkeyes. The latest installment of the big trip. We followed their journey over the summer to Europe. It debuts tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, only on the Big Ten Network. Here is a sneak peek of what to expect. Good morning, all. How are we feeling? So good. Locked in. Locked in. Super excited. International travel to me means time for your team to come together. We are going to Naples, Italy. Let's go overseas. Yeah. And split in Dubrovnik in Croatia. Some of our teammates have never been to Europe or have never left the country. I know the food is good in Italy. I know ciao. That's all I got. Ciao! Ciao! <laughs> I don't even know everything that we're doing. I'm just going to try to go with the flow. We're going to do zip lining. Oh, boy. Oh, my God! We're going to have a cooking class together. Hey, what do you know? Kate, struggling. We will do some kayaking. <laughs> And obviously, you know, the games are going to be fun, too. Together. One, two, three. Together. Not going to lie, we're all here to see Caitlin Clark. Come on, Luck. She's my CTV. There's just something really pretty cool and magical that happens with teams that go overseas. I <laughs> When they graduate from Iowa and they go on from here, these are the things they're going to really remember. Looks awesome. Uh, from the big trip to the big picture, we talked last week about how significant Saturday was for the four future Big Ten teams. Bit of a mixed bag. Washington and Oregon both played a really <laughs> high-level game in Seattle. The Huskies pulled it out by three. USC fell for the first time this season. Turnovers did them in in South Bend. And UCLA struggled against a really good Oregon State team. They fell by 12 in Corvallis. Want to focus on Oregon and Washington. This game lived up to the hype. I would say Dan Lanning might want to rethink some of the fourth down philosophy, mm -hmm. perhaps a little bit, but still give Washington a ton of credit. Michael Penix was really good, despite the fact he battled cramps throughout the game. This was just a really good game 
between two excellent teams with the Huskies coming out on top. Yeah, it delivered. This was the game that we hoped it was going to be, just executing at a really high level. We do have some controversy we can discuss. The fourth down <laughs> decisions later on helps the game live on a little bit. But these offenses were as good as advertised, and they gave these defenses quite a handful because you had Washington, the quick strikes, the big yeah. passing plays, a bunch of those different receivers involved. And then Oregon, a much more balanced mm -hmm. attack, and they had a really good run game. But it was phenomenal really high level I came out of it thinking these are two of the top five teams in the country without a doubt and they both play on both sides of the ball do a really good job and as I'm watching that game I'm like hmm they seem to be playing the game at a little different speed a little different level than than some other places around the country but that to me is why it's so exciting and, and we talked about a lot about just how good the quarterbacks are this year in the Pac-12 and these guys deliver. They're yeah. great. These wide like receivers. Bo, Bo Nix was phenomenal, oh, too. Like, yeah, everyone's going to talk about Penix. Yeah, but that's, but that's yeah. what I talk about. I'm talking yeah. about these quarterbacks. Yeah, they're you both think really about, good. You just yep. think about their ability to, to navigate, and they never – in these offenses, they never look worried on the sideline. Mm -mm. Nobody, yeah. nobody looks worried. They're like, okay, we'll get the ball back, and we'll go to work. Okay, well, so uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to interject just yeah. to get to the fourth down stuff. That's what I, I was, yeah. was going to okay, say. Okay, so, so what, what did you make? So you had two times – Basically deep in Washington's territory, mm -hmm. could have gotten a field goal, instead yep. went for it on fourth down, both times failed. And then around midfield, end of the game, mm -hmm. fourth and three, if you get it, you win the game. Yep. But you didn't get it, and you give Washington the ball with a short field. So yep. what did you make as, as a football guy? You know, I, I think right now people are, are playing the odds and, and what they want to do. And right. they believe they really believe that they're going to be able to execute these plays. So I don't think it's a situation where they think, okay, well, what happens if we lose? They don't think about that part of it until they go into the press conference. But ultimately, it, it, it starts and stops with the head coach making those decisions. And he admitted that those are probably the wrong decisions at that time. We probably should have done something different, obviously. But this is the way they're playing the game out there. I mean, they are playing the odds, and, and it didn't come through because they played against a good defense. Yeah, so I think, like, you know, if they convert right before the mm -hmm. half and they get those points on the board, we feel differently, and we're like, yes. look at this aggression. Yeah. We mm -hmm. love this from Dan Lanning. Yeah. This is something that this is how they play. We saw these teams go for two after touchdowns. Like, there was a lot of yeah. aggressive decision-making. If it works, it looks great, yeah. and it yeah. changes the game. The one that I had the least amount of issue with was the one at the end. Because otherwise, do you not think that Washington's going to score? <laughs> They'll just go the length of the field. Yeah, that they right. need to go the length of the I mean, field. But if you pin them at the one-yard line with no yeah. time I'm out. still convinced okay. that they will score. <laughs> so at that point, you have yeah. no time to yeah. come back right. yourself. And you have faith in your own offense. So you're going for just a couple of yards to end the game. That one I understand. But, yes, this is analytics. These are different philosophies about how you play these different moments. But I would have put – points on the board at the yeah. end of the first half in a game where yes there were a lot of points and you're probably playing for touchdowns but you still need those three points in a game yeah. that was going to stay close that was the one I had more of an issue with but at the end of the game I just think you're trying to say I want to end the game with my yeah. team on the field and not give Michael Penix the length of the field and end the game probably on that drive right I do think like when you look at teams with great offenses and you say to them three yards to win the game you're taking that Right. I think that's what he's saying. I that that was the it. message. Now, right? I, I will say they're 0 for 8 on fourth down in their last two losses, Oregon is. So it's a bit of a problem. It's possible it had, maybe you they need probably to, shouldn't lose. Maybe you need to rethink <laughs> some of the, the analysis of the numbers and, uh, of the analytics. Yes. Uh,